All right. Uh, I am David Snyder. I am the Senior Director of Foundation Engineering for a company called Optum. Optum is a services uh, and, um, well, IT and services and development arm of United Health Group, which is a uh, parent company of United Health Care, which is health and benefits. Uh, many people are more familiar with that branch. Uh, I run a group called Foundation Engineering, which is essentially uh, infrastructure engineering, compute, network, and storage. And part of our job is to introduce new technology and solutions to the company. So uh, let's skip that. So essentially, uh, years ago, when my team would kind of come up with some of these uh, ideas and some of this new technology, there would be someone like me who would essentially say, I've got a great idea. We're going to go ahead and implement technology X. And then everybody would kind of start working on it. They'd start building. They'd start learning, teaching each other how to use the solution. And we'd go and test it, and things would be working pretty well until we'd get into the pilot phase. And then once we get into pilot phase and in production, we'd realize all the reasons why it's probably a bad idea. Things aren't working quite well. They're not going smooth. And most of that's because uh, someone at a, at a senior leadership level can be somewhat disconnected from how the technology really works to how they might have seen it working in, say, a demo or something else. So uh, regardless, because it was such a great idea to begin with, we would put it into operations hands anyways, and it would be a fairly predictable train wreck. So um, <laughs> it wasn't working very well. It would cause all kinds of problems and havoc. Teams didn't trust each other. They were unhappy with the solutions. Even the people working on the solutions weren't happy because it wasn't something that they really all that invested in or even thought was going to work in the first place. So um, we started looking into uh, Lean to visualize our work, make sure that we had a, the ability to know who was working on what, and, and then that gave us the uh, ability to manage our work in progress. So we're using Kanban. Um, uh, we decided, or not decided, we started to reduce our lead time and then improve our flow efficiency and then just use some of that extra uh, time to measure and improve. So. This was the beginning of a journey into what we're going to talk about in a little while here, but we started you know, working together better. So uh, as we were going through some of this work, we discovered discovery, right? This, this kind of sounds weird, but we did. So we realized that a lot of the work that we did that was, um, uh, it was mostly implementation, but there was that phase when you're trying to figure out the solution to a problem where you're really in this land of discovery. And when you're doing discovery work, the way you do things is very, very different. It's not uh, procedural. It's not step-by-step. Uh, -step. There's false starts. There's learnings. There's you know pivoting, all this stuff. And so we realized that uh, in our work, at least, in technology interaction, we needed to kind of change the behaviors of some of the, the teams in this discovery phase. So, as we were looking at uh, some of this stuff, we'd read a lot of books. Uh, one of them was Lean Enterprise. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a, in a second. But it talked about this idea of three innovation horizons. And those three innovation horizons are where you're spending a lot of time trying to figure out uh, what are the big technology bets you're going to make in, you know, now that'll be important, say, four or five years from now, versus the things that you've been doing and you have a, a strong confidence with that maybe you're not spending as much time innovating, but you're just trying to maintain. But as we were reading about that, it spent a lot of time talking about hypotheses. Uh, so for us, that was somewhat of a new concept, especially in technology introduction. So in the hypothesis, you're trying to prove uh, you know, something is true or, or false. So we started looking at how we apply this, I, uh, this hypothesis idea to some of the work we were doing. So in a hypothesis, you test the idea. And then you essentially get feedback. Now, that feedback could be in how the product works. Feedback could be from your customers. Is the actual, uh, you know, does the product that you're showing them even meet their needs? Uh, now, after you've done some of that feedback and testing a couple of iterations, you can validate. Is this something that's going to work? And if it is, great. Then you can move into that more steady process of delivery, right? There's a bunch of steps you got to do to operationalize something. Otherwise, the good news is, is you can say, hey, guess what? Not a good idea, and we're just going to cut our losses here and move on. So one of the things we realized after we started working through this was we spent an awful lot of time trying to force things to happen, uh, make this particular technology work. 
add all kinds of tech, uh, automation or whatever else you can around it to just force the issue. Now, what that did is that took away our opportunity to really look at something that would have actually met a customer's needs. So these were really big missed opportunities, and we didn't want to do that anymore. So we started working. Uh, this is a picture of one of our Kanban boards. And before all of this started, we had this area right here, which was our delivery board. Um, so we added this discovery section at the beginning of all of our delivery and ignore all the work and process limits uh, violations. Those don't exist. Uh, so anyhow, but the, the cool thing about adding this discovery phase at the beginning is it, it started to show us that we could um, fail fast. Right, so the, the columns and everything else that are in this value stream were really designed to make sure that <clears throat> we knew pretty well that what we were about to implement and spend a lot of time, because this part is the bigger chunk of the pie, uh, that it was really going to meet the customer's needs. So that's one example of our board. But as we started doing the discovery work and showing and, well, introducing new technology using the discovery, we started getting lots of questions from other people. It's like, well, how did you decide that this was a good idea or that was a good idea? And so that introduced a new challenge, which was you know, somebody who's been doing all this discovery work, they have all of these uh, trials and errors, they've got all this learning that they've done, but we didn't have a good way of really showing people, okay, so why did you choose technology X over technology Y? Or why do we have to implement this uh, particular setting over that particular setting? So that was also starting to become somewhat problematic for us. Also, uh, we didn't exactly have all the greatest uh, buy-in from some of our leaders. Uh, so if you go to leader A and say, hey, we need you know, to implement Kubernetes over Mesos, or we need to implement uh, KVM instead of ESX, they you know, may or may not be receptive, depending on the leader. But most people are probably not terribly receptive to big uh, technology changes like that. So we needed a way to be able to show them that, hey, we've, we've actually done some homework, we've done some testing, this isn't just uh, a, an idea that somebody had, there's actual data behind it. So we needed to be able to have a tool or a mechanism that we could use to kind of show those leaders that uh, this, this is intentional, right? So as we started looking for ways to help, given that we'd already read a lot of books around Lean and Kanban and Lean Enterprise and whatnot, one of the books was Toyota Kata. So we started getting really interested in um, how we can use a practice like Toyota Kata to maybe help us. Because that was also uh, based on experimenting, uh, proving in, or disproving hypotheses, et cetera. So if people aren't familiar with Toyota Kata, um, essentially a Kata uh, is a Japanese word and it's for, it basically means detailed choreographed patterns of movements that are practiced in solo or in pairs. And so the idea behind a kata in you know, martial arts would be you know, trying to develop muscle memory for some of the movements. So it's an intentional practice, right, when you really want to boil it down. So what it means for us in IT is that we use uh, an intentional practice to get good at a particular thing. In this case, we wanted to get good at discovery work. We wanted to get good at learning. Uh, and so we looked to some of the information that was available online. We talked to a few people in the Kata community and started to develop this process uh, to essentially do our discovery work and, and track this learning. So a little bit more about the Kata. Um, we started with something that's called, uh, there's lots of variations of the Kata, just in case uh, people aren't familiar with it. So one of them is called the Improvement Kata. And this is really big in manufacturing and in IT. Uh, but basically, if you've heard of things like a, a PDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act, or an OODA loop, um, there's, there's a whole bunch of different variations kind of on the same theme. But in the improvement kata, you start with a basic understanding of where you want to go. What is the direction that you want to, uh, to go? Uh, and then what is your current condition? So where are you now? And then, where do you want to be next? Not where do you want to be at the end, but where do, what's the, where do you want to be at the end of the next step? And then you iterate through that to, uh, to get to your solution. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little bit about a, uh, this is a, an experience report we did probably about a year ago. Uh, this was one of our, I think this was our second or third iteration of this new process. But we use this as an experience report because 
it, uh, it, was, it was quite a challenge from both uh, an operations and a leadership point to, to kind of understand how the team had come to some conclusions. And this process really, really helped. So I'm not going to, I'm going to skip this slide because this is for more of a, a general audience. I think hopefully everyone knows what a VM is. <laughs> so um, the challenge that we had, uh, at least at, at Optum, is we had, um, you know, a, a VM cluster size of uh, 16 nodes. And we would get some requests in for people who wanted these really, really big ones. You know, 32 CPUs, 256 gigs of RAM on the VM, and they were causing all kinds of performance problems when they would see uh, peak utilization. So it, it, was, it was becoming a real big issue anytime somebody would spin up something that was super process intensive on one of these large VMs. And so we were trying, the, the challenge was, we gotta fix that. We can't have this type of a problem happening in our environment. It causes headaches with all the other application teams and nobody's happy. So uh, we said, hey, great, we're gonna use this new uh, improvement kata process to figure out what to do and let's see how that works out. So we gave the team a mission. They need to go figure out how to make this uh, non-impactful when people have these really, really large uh, systems. So what's on the screen here, uh, this is uh, something called uh, the product kata. It's a variation on the improvement kata. You can see there's lots of versions of this stuff. Uh, so this is developed by a person named Melissa Perry. And what she, uh, she was more of a, a product manager type. And she used this simple sort of a spreadsheet to uh, kind of iterate towards a product solution fit with her customers. Now, we weren't doing product management but it was really kind of close to what we were trying to figure out. We were trying to figure out technology solution fit with the enterprise. She was figuring out product uh, uh, feature fit with her customers. So we, you know, we had some conversations with her and we totally stole this from her and, and kind of adapted it a little bit ourselves. But what's interesting about this is, um, so the goal, the goal is essentially where someone like me would come in and say, uh, team, you have to go figure out a, a solution. Uh, it has to be, uh, it can't be very specific from a technology direction standpoint, because otherwise that kind of steals away from the team's ability to exercise some creativity. So it needs to be more, hey, what's the end state that I'm looking for? So in this case, we're like, hey, you know, anyone who has these really big VMs, we need to make sure that it, uh, it doesn't cause problems. Uh, and so then we create what's called the target condition, and this is what we challenge the team to achieve. Now this could be any number of things. In this particular example, it was make sure that uh, you know, we can give people big stuff, but it doesn't cause problems with all the other application teams. So we have uh, here the current condition, uh, and this is where the team themselves end up filling out this type of a, a spreadsheet to uh, iterate towards their solution. So the current condition is whatever the team thinks their current condition is. Obstacle is what's preventing them from moving forward. Doesn't always have to be an obstacle. Sometimes there is. The step is the next step they're going to take. Uh, expected is what they expect the outcome to be. And it's surprising how often we're wrong about what the actual expected outcome is. And then learned is where you record your learnings. Here's how, you know, I, there, here's what we figured out on, in this particular step. So it's a pretty easy uh, process here. There's nothing really magical about it, but you need to make sure the teams are, are using very small steps and iterating. By the end of the, the process, we had many, many, many lines of learning as they worked their way through to the solution. So uh, after a few iterations, uh, through that process, the team came back and they said, hey, we've got it. <laughs> we've got this awesome solution. Uh, it's going to be less power, higher VM densities, uh, smaller failure domains, larger VM sizes, uh, smaller footprints, uh, which was all great until they said we're going to use uh, essentially rack mount servers, uh, which was quite surprising because we had standardized like a decade ago on blades. And so, I mean, it wasn't uh, like, oh my gosh, what are you guys thinking? But it was still, there was a ton of analysis that went into us adopting blades many, 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 many years ago. So in the senior leadership levels, that was like how we saved tons of money in, in data center space and everything else. So going back to rack mount servers was very, very counterintuitive to the operations teams and, and the leadership. So, and that became really, really evident when we sat down with everybody and said, hey, all right, so 
we figured out how to solve this problem and it's X. And yeah, it was not very well received at all. In fact, most people were uh, quite skeptical, including myself, right? Because we had this really, really awesome platform that we could build, uh, you know, really, really scalable, low power, lots of density. And the team was saying, yeah, but we really want this older thing here. This thing is going to actually be way better. So it just, it didn't feel right. It was very uncomfortable for, uh, for a lot of people involved. So we sent the team back and said, all right, walk us through this, help us understand exactly how you came to this conclusion. So that's where this tool became incredibly valuable because it wasn't one of those things where you was just a no, it was just, you know, show your work. Tell us how you came to conclusion X. So the team was able to bring up the tool that they'd been using and they were able to show, hey, well, here's kind of how we iterated through this. So the first thing that they did is, uh, you know, we always want to make sure we start with customers. So, all right, somebody's asking for big VMs. We should go verify with our customers. Is this even really a, a, a valid need? So that was their first obstacle. They had no idea why people even wanted things this big. They're pretty huge. They didn't really, you know, you would think that they probably didn't need them that big. So their first step was actually to go interview. Uh, and talk to the real customers, the people who are asking for these things, just to validate that the problem is even real. Um, and so, sure enough, they come back and had their little, uh, their, their interviews and whatnot with the customers, and sure enough, yes, uh, there are valid actual configuration um, requirements from vendors and everything else that, yeah, this, pretty simple to figure out, they're legitimate use cases. So then the next one was, okay, so, um, while they were doing that interview, they actually learned something new, and that was that also we have a storage problem. So it wasn't just CPU and memory, it was storage is totally out of whack as well, and uh, we're doing some really funky stuff to give customers, you know, uh, 16 terabytes worth of data if they need it for their, for their databases and whatnot. And so they had to, uh, you know, that was actually a new learning that they also realized we have to solve this problem. And so what we have today is just not going to scale. And so once they came to the conclusion, all right, now we, need, we know we need to scale to a, a different platform, they started looking into um, you know, some of the solutions. So uh, they found that, first of all, what we currently had, uh, the blade standards, there wasn't a really a good model that would actually go up to the size that some of these requests were for. And so through their iteration and their work, uh, they found the form factor that would actually be able to accommodate the size of the VMs that the team needed. So they found that, that uh, rack mount server platform and then uh, did a little bit more iteration and, and work to show that uh, not only is this a place where we can put really big VMs, uh, but it's also because they're of the size and everything else, it makes sense to fill in some of the areas with small VMs as well to kind of balance the load. So essentially it became, well, you know, this is a platform where we should host everything and it's just going to be, you know, much, much, much bigger, but we'll also save a ton of money. Uh, and that's for, through licensing and everything else. So they did a really, really thorough analysis is what really came out of this, this, uh, this exercise. A really thorough analysis to get to a conclusion. So again, we have to have a couple more meetings because we're a big enterprise. Uh, so we have more and more meetings and eventually... Uh, <laughs> After seeing the work and everything else, everyone understood and agreed. Yeah, right. We didn't necessarily get 100% uh, agreement, but we got consensus. So, yeah, this is the right thing to do. We're going to go ahead and move forward. So, um, there's a, a few slides after this one where I go into a couple more learnings. But what was the most interesting about this for me, uh, that particular exercise, uh, is it forced the actual technologists to not jump to a solution, right? Because all of us, uh, many of us probably have in our heads uh, biases and foregone conclusions on what the right answer is. So by forcing the team into this learning mode, what do you think is gonna happen? What actually happened? It really changes the mindset and allows them to be open to different directions to take. So the challenge that they were given was, give me big VMs. But what they actually came up with was uh, a, a better platform that saved a ton more money as well as um, would give us, you know, the, the, the end state we were looking for. So it's a really interesting tool for, for anyone who's trying to make sure that they 
don't, or that they prevent that, that jumping into jumping to conclusions. So anyhow, uh, let's see, I think I covered that one. So in closing, basically for me as well, from a leadership perspective, um, if you look at someone who's been in the industry for a long time, uh, they probably got there through a lot of expertise, a lot of um, you know uh, high performance, and you know being able to demonstrate that they can can learn as well as adapt and implement some of these new technologies. But what's interesting is when you have that person and then they take on a leadership role, uh, the time that they used to be able to spend learning and understanding the technology diminishes rapidly uh, to the point where they have none. However, they're so used to still having the answer and knowing what should be done uh, by the team. And it can be hard to break out of that, um, I'll say that, that model. So despite the fact that they don't have that time, they're still trying to drive direction. Now what this does, a process like this, is it allows a leader to essentially participate in the learning process, even though they don't actually um, have the time to, to put in the effort and the trial and error. They can see where the team went, they can understand the challenges that were faced, how those challenges were overcome, and so they can still benefit from the team learning uh, as well. Uh, this is also really, really helpful for the rest of the organization because it's very, very common. There's about a thousand ways to do anything. It's very common for people to say, well, eh, we should have done this. Well, let's go to the actual data. Let's look at the kata, let's talk it through, and uh, you can see how we came to our conclusion. They still might not necessarily 100% agree with you, but at least they know what sort of a path you followed to get to where you're going. And yeah, that was it. So I wasn't sure if we should stop for questions or since you're recording. Are there questions? Yeah.